I now welcome my second panel. Let me start from the right, Professor Jörg Recher, he's president of the European School of Management and Technology. Roland Berger, founder of Roland Berger, we all know this company, Kai Konrad, director of the Max Planck Institute for Taxation Law and Public Finances, and Professor Peter Huber, he is from the Federal Constitutional Court. Welcome. Professor Rochol is introducing the second panel. Well, Mrs. Flick, now you're in for a surprise. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of Convoco. For 10 years, Corinne Flick led us out of the constitutional law from Mr. Kimsey and invited us to Salzburg. And every year, she asked us to lead this interdisciplinary discussion. And this year, we faced the challenge of talking to a medical expert. And of course, this was a chance of getting new insight. Mrs. Flick, for all your efforts, you prepare the Convoco Forum and lectures and Convoco has become your life, as it were. We would like to thank you for your commitment and are looking forward to the next 10 years. I'm very surprised and I'm touched. Again, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, you know, we all are Convoco, aren't we? And you know, this was really a surprise. Thank you very much. You know, after these justified celebrations, it is very difficult to, you know, move to economics particularly when thinking about the breadth and width of the discussions which we had over the last 24 hours against this backdrop, it is very difficult to justify to the depth of our discussions. Therefore, I'd like to focus on three items, touch on three items which have been part of our discussions and it shows that inaction has gained a great significance for the economy, for the companies, but also for the state in its interaction with the industry. One, time consistency is one of the terms which economists use. In simple terms, it is all about a state saying or doing that is acting according to a promise which he gave for the future. For instance, if I promise legal security or legal safety for a company, then I must guarantee this legal safety the very next day and should not act opportunistically, i.e. a situation which might occur in the future to be used by the state. This refers to investment in oil fields. States having taken a decision in favor of investment modify things by simply introducing higher taxes and you know skimmed off the higher oil prices. Now the question is how can you make sure that in such a situation i.e. in future the state will have higher profits how can you, you know, companies know that if they know that ex ante, that there might be higher taxation later on, how can you avoid companies from making these investments in the, in the first place? So this would an action which would be to the detriment of a state. And there's a similar example from economic uh, sciences. It is 
the problem or the question of the independence of central banks, because it might be a great temptation for a state to cause a central bank to lower interest rates, to influence exchange rates and manipulate exchange rates uh, in one direction. And of course, under certain circumstances, this might be a benefit or an advantage. But in the long run, it uh, might bring about, uh, say, damage because there might be wrong expectations or other negative uh, repercussions. So this is important because the state has to think about how to avoid action in order to create better conditions in future. And another question, how can you create institutions who avoid or avoid acting? One possible solution would be to introduce independent central banks. That's item number one. Item number two, you know, avoiding action might play an important role for companies as well. The financial financial crisis uh, illustrated this very well. Companies, and this was touched on earlier, in economic terms, companies also caused external effects that is affecting others of the public life in a country, including this state. For instance, banks were no longer or investors were no longer in a position to save one or rescue one or the other bank, and therefore the state has to step in and help out. Other actors were affected by the decisions in the industry, and the result was, and this is what license to operate for companies, this license to operate is no longer granted to the extent it was granted a few years ago. So actions of companies and of a, a market economy system is considered uh, more critical in more critical terms these days than in the past. Question, how can companies, by stepping up their efforts with a view to corporate responsibility and similar aspects, how can these companies make sure that the license to operate is granted to them so that the state and the public extend the trust and the confidence to these companies so that they can do business? And then this is a consequence of uh, the financial crisis, the legislator came up with a few regulatory requirements which are very difficult to understand. There are dozens of regulatory or statutory rules and regulations on a national and international level which try to constrain the operations or the, say, leeway latitude of a company. Now, are all these measures, are all these new rules and regulations go beyond uh, the intended purpose so that they, that we might have a hyperactivity at the end. For instance, just follow a political impulse, follow a public awareness which is not covered by the empirical evidence. And to sum it up in one, for instance, Mr. Huber from Monsters Q mentioned this phrase, if it is not necessary to make a law, then it is necessary not to make a law. So. there might be an activity of the state. And this brings me to the third item on my list. Looking forward means that we will face enormous challenges, we meaning the economy, the public and the state without, uh, you know, singling out the individual uh, claims. We've got climate change, digitalization and digitization, both that is how companies respond to digitalization, but also questions of social inequality that we need ideas, ideas which need innovation and competition in order to implement them. You know, what is crucial here is that this competition or that this uh, competition for ideas is based on human energy, which is used which is harnessed in order to bring about these in innovations. And now something else comes on stage, that is, if the state uh, intervenes too much or if the state takes away too much from the possibilities of a company, this possibility to face uh, the challenges of the future in a good way might fail. 
So another aspect is that a society must be able to respond fast and flexibly to changes which are not yet known these days, or not all facets of that, such challenges are known now. And another question, maybe a question for the panel discussion, can be summed up in one phrase, or maybe two sub-phrases or sub-sentences. How can the state avoid intervening in the industry or in the financial life too much? And how can companies avoid the state, or how can companies avoid making use or harness the possibilities of the state or of the public too much? Now, who would like to ask, uh, to answer Ms. the last question? Well, Mr. Conrad just complained a bit the situation in about the situation in Germany and the protection of fundamental rights now. The protection of fundamental rights is also implying the freedom of the state and the intervention of the state in order to guarantee the freedom. There are a whole range of decisions. Wolfgang Schön mentioned the fiscal law and taxation. And of course, you have also mentioned the importance to protect trust and impact for the future has been on our agenda all the whole day. So there were companies, private persons, life insurance companies and others, utilities, companies that uh, spent money on atomic power plants. There are proven mechanisms in order to guarantee trust and in order to avoid excessive state intervention. I think we have a number of traditional instruments and tools that help us. This is not a lump sum answer, but it would be an insinuation of tools that could be used. If I may, reasonable business needs legal protection. On the other hand, business is to serve society. In other words, the citizens need goods and services at best, at the best possible price and for the best possible benefit. Now, as we have learned, a market economy is the best way to guarantee that citizens enjoy the best products and services. However, market economy does not mean a laissez-faire approach, i.e. you need societal intervention, but you need the framework conditions of the free market. Now, the abuse of power would be a topic we have to tackle here, i.e. the prevention of monopolies, for example, antitrust laws and similar procedures to guarantee the competition are needed. And then, of course, we have to deal with distribution. We have to make sure that the market economy, the economic form we have chosen is being accepted by the citizens, by society, which means that there should not be major differences in terms of income, salaries, wealth, and there is a third dimension I see, and that's technological progress, because the the uh, explosion of wealth, I might 
want to call it, i.e. what we have seen in the last 250 years. In 1750, the gross domestic product was the same all over the world. Wealth was equally distributed and we were dealing with societies without technical and technological progress then. Since there has been technological progress, the situation has changed dramatically. The uh, quality of products has improved considerably. Prices have dropped and the possibilities to spread the wealth and the economic benefit has changed too. We had different trends, so to speak. First, the development in the United Kingdom, then on the European continent, then in the United States of America. And there have been attempts, time and again, to limit competition by, for example, introducing a planned economy system but all these attempts have failed because in these alternative systems, the scientific progress was hampered and a scientific progress had been needed in order to achieve technological progress and in order to enhance the productivity and in order to increase the incomes of people. And that's what we see all over the world today. Look at the differences, different incomes, different salary levels in different economies of the world. China, now here or there, the industrial aid, began in 1950 in uh, Europe. The Industrial Age started 200 years earlier, which means that the income per capita in China is about one-fifth of what people earn in Europe. It has become evident that companies that can do business freely and respect the morals and the values of a society will benefit most in a market economy in the long run and contribute as much as possible to the economic wealth of the citizens of a country, which is why it's very important to have a public order, a state guarantee, and a framework to ensure competition, but then you also have to have rules for the competition in order to avoid the abuse from power happening. Laws won't help us. I mean, they do help, but they are not the only ingredient. You also need ethics. You need responsibility and values. You need to have people refrain from abusing power, accumulating and accusing power. That's why the market economy is a mix of legal framework conditions and a certain uh, control over time and ethics and social standards which are being accepted and respected by the producers and by the consumers. In addition, if I may, because I think that it's good to have different opinions and still have people speak the same language. Now, we, we all speak the same language, but we also share the same opinion, which is not a really exciting point of departure for an exciting debate. Now, what do you do? Well, let's try and find an opponent outside, I'd say. In the last one and a half days, we have talked about the question whether to refrain from growth would be an important virtue. Or obligation sounds plausible. 
has a lot of support in Germany as well. We had an inquiry commission established by the parliament that said that it would be good to have such an approach in France. And the president invited Nobel Prize winners and others in order to talk about the status of the GDP in France and about the question whether happiness could be a better indicator in order to check the wealth of a country. I mean, of course, you can do quite a bit if you go and focus on happiness. You might also have drugs involved and media. I mean, there are a number of indicators you may push. And there are different tens. There's also Mr. Meagle's book about this topic. So there is the opponent out there who has a different opinion from us. But this is not a good idea if you want to go for in action. In his introduction, Mr. Mohol reminded us of two core aspects, one aspect, and that's the one Roland Berger has just mentioned, for the benefit of peace in an economy it's important that these that there are subjectively felt income dynamics we know that the united states are less dynamic than other parts of the world they are less dynamic as europe and people feel that there is a certain dynamics of income in europe which is why people favor a market economy, which again triggers new dynamics in a world in which growth is being blocked. However, in a world in which growth is being blocked, people don't strive for creating more, but they want to get a bigger piece of the cake, which is the basis of uh, social or societal conflicts in such a situation. And this is one of the reasons why the opponents of growth have to bear in mind that in such a situation, we will be dealing with a new situation. We will have the elbow society then too, but this won't be about moving forward anymore. This is about getting more. And then this form of inaction is not a good idea. And that gets me to Thomas Schellinger, the Nobel Prize winner, who has developed the game theory and the balance of horror. However, he did not talk about it. Mr. Maumann was the one who talked about war and peace. He talked about the climate. And he said that the climate challenge we are meeting in the world cannot be denied. He said, it's there, it's big, and anyway, we are dealing with major challenges, and the only possibility to deal with these challenges is by doing three things. A, a society needs to meet the technological challenges by adopting or embracing technological progress. B, we need smart people who are capable of implementing this technology, of applying it and we need the power, the resource power of the economy. We need the capacities in order to be capable of reaction at all. That's what he called the adaptability of a society, of an economy. And that's the key answer to the major challenges our societies are meeting today. I mean, where do we see problems? We see lots of problems. There where is, there is no growth. Well, Connor was so nice to look for the opponent just beyond the stage. You know, I'd like to challenge you and would comment on what Mr. Berg and Mr. Rocha said. Central banks, Mr. Rocha said, are an instrument which are supposed to guarantee reliability and stability. But it is amazing that it doesn't really work in practice. At least there are arguments about it. And irrespective of that, 
that is irrespective of how you see things in legal terms, I can say that the task portfolio of our European Central Bank has changed over the last two to three years. It has expanded indeed. Three weeks ago, I went to Rome. I was uh, having dinner with uh, Giovanni Amato when the Central Bank Council said that they have uh, introduced a family promotion and a mid-sized company promotion program, which is distributed through the banks. And I said, Peter, don't you think that this is a good thing? And he said, well, you know, maybe, but in the past we had family and economics ministries for that and not a central bank, meaning this idea will work out only if the cobbler sticks to his last, i.e., that is, the task portfolio is narrow. Roland Berger, I agree to everything you said, you know, rule-based social market economy. Yes, but I must say we found out if things really come to a crunch, then the rules don't work. Then the banks like the AGR and the Commerce Bank, which had to go bankrupt, are rescued because the social costs of an insolvency nobody wanted to bear. So I can understand the situation. I do not really criticize. I only want to say rule-based approach of our market economy might also require that you've got, you know, a stiffer, robust backbone and, the negative, and, and can bear or wish to wear the negative consequences of an action. And whether we are really ready to do so, well, I'm not really convinced. And this takes me to the first podium, uh, first panel discussion. They talked about this, uh, the smoker. Yes, life insurance and uh, the freedom one has. You know, as soon as we've got this ill smoker who cannot pay for his or her treatment, then I don't believe that our society will accept that uh, this uh, smoker is, you know, left to his or her own devices, living on the street, for instance, dying away. So empathy and other instruments we might be forced to, you know, assume the responsibility for such a patient. I haven't got a real good solution. You know, under stress, I can say the rule-based social market economy will, you know, function only to a limited extent, and, you know, limiting indebtedness, etc., etc. It doesn't really work, does it? It may also have to do with our expectations, that is, the expectations of our society and the social peace which uh, Roland Berger touched on. You see, if things come to a crunch, then will we really be, or don't you think we will, say, deviate from the rules? Well, my response might be disappointing when it comes to, you know, uh, with a view to this discussion, because I do not really, you know, disagree. I mentioned this. I was talking about the situation before the financial crisis. Here, there was a firm conviction that stable banks or central banks will be able to handle uh, the general financial situation better than, say, a finance ministry. Now, inaction, and this is the problem of inaction on the part of central banks, you know, the central banks and this might not have to do with their, say, original assignment or remit, they might use this uh, to bring in order other things, stabilization of the financial market, stabilizing or guarantee credits, or making sure that credits can still be granted. And this refers to specific segments of the industry or companies. And, of course, these short -term, the short-term benefit which is created in acting like this will be outweighed by long-term risks which, are, which emerge on account of that or as a result of that. Here we see the first uh, repercussions of uh, bubbles created. We also see questions surfacing saying whether or not all the companies who demand credits should really get or obtain credits, whether or not capital flows will really flow to where they are supposed to flow, whether or not they are, you know, guided there. So inaction, of course, first is a legal question. Is that possible within the remit of the central banks? But it is also a question of whether or not this inaction is necessary in order 
to maintain the independence of the central banks, i.e. the price, price stability. Maybe I should expand on that. The fact that a central bank is responsible for price stability only or primarily for price stability, well, this is a heritage of the German Bundesbank, which, fortunately enough, the government, uh, the German government, integrated this in, you know, in the birth of the euro, you know, uh, the Bank of the States of America or the British Central uh, Bank, you know, they handle things in a different in a different way. It is all about functioning growth and the distribution of growth to make sure that there is employment. There are different alternatives, you know, various alternatives. You're talking about the European Central Bank. I can say that the European Central Bank took over the Bundesbank example. And this was a, well, this was the price, actually, which the Germans were able to claim in order to join the Euro zone or the Euro countries. If you go to France today, if you go to Italy today, I just want to single out these two major countries, then people are of the opinion in general that it was a mistake to listen to or to agree on this very narrow mandate uh, defined for the central bank, i.e. determining uh, pricing stability, whether we should follow the Federal Reserve in the States or the central bank in, or the Bank of England in, in the UK, well, whether or not we can have active state subsidies in order to make sure that this credit uh, circle really works. You know, basically, I agree, we are in a European legal, say, association and in this respect the european central bank has tested out the limits and if not exceeded uh, its limits of responsibility but today nowadays we've got 18 members of the eurozone but only a small minority of three or four countries would still be ready to accept such a narrow mandate for the european central bank in other words to sign a maastricht treatment a treaty which is the basis for uh, this uh, European um, constitution. So this is the real controversy within the Eurozone relating to growth, relating to stability, relating to employment and the distribution of employment. You know the figures, Spain 26, 27 percent unemployment of those uh, 52 to 56 percent of young unemployed. And of course, you can imagine the social tensions which will emerge. And this does not only happen in Spain, I believe. Yes, we have a problem, we face an issue, but it has been our will to accept this narrow mandate for the European Central Bank, but, uh, you know, no long, uh, there won't be all 18 uh, countries who will agree. Yes, I think the, eight, uh, the, the, the founding countries of the Eurozone really did well by founding the European Central Bank, particularly when looking at uh, the interest rates in the first uh, few months or years. This refers to the windfall profits. This refers to credits to or finances to companies. I must say that this was a golden age, so to speak. All the things that have happened there were good. And then at the time, the states favored this model. And over the years, they harnessed and reaped the benefits fully reap the benefits of the system. And as it is with time consistency, the world is changing, the circumstances changes, and under different, you know, under different cir circumstances, different decisions would be optimal. Under a certain cir circum condition in Italy or in France, people might have entered into another contract or treaty and might want to renegotiate. And uh, we 
cannot say an economist would always be against uh, renegotiating thing, things that everything has been carved into stone and that uh, and that you know that that it should be possible to expand the mandate of the European Central Bank, but this is possible only in connection with a reform, the form of the governance structure of this institution per se. If this institution, and we should recall that this institute started against the backdrop of this narrow mandate, and you know the European Central Bank and its mandate and the surroundings have been defined with a view to this manda. It has not been made for a Eurozone which is drifting apart. You know, the nationalisms and the advantages and disadvantages of a European cent central bank policy, of course, will have an influence on the actions and they have to act accordingly. And you know, the European Central Bank was not uh, conceived, so to speak, uh, against uh, against the backdrop of such circumstances, but it also might mean that we really have to start thinking from scratch. So one aspect of this uh, governance structure would be, we could say, not each and every country has got a vote in the cent Euro European Central Bank, but maybe the votes would be distributed um, according to special sacrifices which countries have to make in order to stabilize the European economy. Well, then you also have to make sure that the country which pays most will or has a different, say, weight when voting. Now, I'm sorry, I don't really want to, talk, to discuss the European Central Bank alone. I'm sorry. I just wanted to single this out as an example of many, i.e., our ideas of a rule-based market economy in which we have, say, entrepreneurs taking their decisions. Such a system will reach its limits when things come to a crunch. And, you know, we were talking about values and morals and that we would resort to them or we should resort to them at least. I understand that. But I ask myself, I wonder whether in a society, and this refers to the presentation which we heard, a lecture which we heard, a society which pluralizes, so which fragments more and more, whether team building, which our speaker was talking about, become more and more difficult because the society hasn't got the coherence or continuity that it had in the past. You know, whether you really can trust in that as kind of wishful thinking, nice. But, you know, uh, you know, somebody said you don't or one doesn't do something like this. This might be one of the rules. So my, my impression when looking at the reality is that whatever you do not do, that, you know, those aspects, those uh, things become fewer and fewer. You see, we, the legal experts, if we cannot agree on anything, then we agree on the rule. I think you touched on a crucial aspect, whether or not the state should help uh, with finances and funds, should help companies which uh, are in the doldrums with finances and, you know, handle things in a way which are not really in line with the rules of market economy. That is, those taking on a risk should have the responsibility for the risk itself as well as the repercussions of risk and should pay the bill at the end of the day. You know, rescuing banks in uh, Germany, and you mentioned two banks. Of course, there, are, there were others who also got mank, some of the Landes banks in, in Germany. You know, when rescuing banks, people had to, and this had to do with the system relevance for the entire economic system, for the stability of the system, or its survival, actually, it was necessary to prevent 
damage to the entire society risk and responsibility for the risk. So these two entities had to be split off, so, so to speak. You had to deviate from this approach. Moral hazard, of course, we faced this issue there. Of course, shareholders or privileged creditors of banks were rescued. They were able to rescue their property, although the banks themselves uh, didn't stand a chance to survive. You know, in a market economy, well, we should not have such a situation frequently because this, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this kind of system would lose its acceptance in the society. Well, usually, the responsibilities for the shareholders and the creditors are increased, are expanded, and at the same time, the commitment of shareholders offering higher equity ratios and uh, of protecting uh, creditors by introducing stricter rules with view to hybrid capital, which they use in order to finance banks, will or should be expanded so that at the end of the day, the profitability i.e. earning money on the part of the states is made more difficult. So you want to learn from the bank banking crisis simply saying that the risk, this is an, a step into the future in order to avoid problems which we had in the past. You know, today banks are paid by funds which build up money or, 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 you know, provide money in order to rescue banks in the future. I can say that a learning process is taking place, which is very slow according to the European way of, of handling things, particularly if all the 18 Eurozone countries have to agree on one approach. But what I want to say is that it will always be like this, and I think this is good. The state has the remit and has the task to avoid damage to the entire society because of an infringement of rules on the part of a, of a company and then continue. I would like to come back to the debate we have just had because here again we are dealing with the consistency of time when I said 10 years ago that if the problems within the banking sector, I will not help, which was not consistent because I never thought what would happen if I would not help. Because I thought that uh, even without any intervention from my side, everything would be solved. But we also have to see the German debate about the pension scheme. Ten years ago, a number of reforms were undertaken, and they were based on a very clear assumptions on the reserves which would build up in the pension system, and which would mean that there would be enough money eventually to pay for the pensions. However, the development has been a different one, and there is some money in the system which is being given away as gifts. Now here, Corriott is certainly right to complain about the lack of protection for the fundamental rights. If the pensions were truly owned by the citizens insured and not by the state, there'd be 
less gifts, I think. But isn't this the case? I thought that um, my entitlement, my pension payment entitlement is my property. Yes and no, but the amounts and the conditions differ and the legislator can actually intervene the way he wants to intervene. A lack of consistency. Maybe we should come back to this particular aspect. Now, this seems to be an important dimension of the whole debate. But we don't have to talk about finance only. We could also talk about ourselves. I used to be a smoker. And what actually kept me from stopping, from quitting, was the idea idea I had in mind with respect tomorrow because I was sure that I would start smoking again tomorrow after giving it up today. I mean, this is once again the lack of consistency. I mean, my conclusion was that I would smoke tomorrow even if I stop smoking today. But the question is actually why should I smoke tomorrow if I give up smoking today? Now, the decisions are, we, we take are based on assumptions, but these assumptions, these foundations, so to speak, of our decisions change. The overall conditions change, and they are being modified. And, of course, we must not necessarily assume that what we deem to be the optimum situation tomorrow will be the situation tomorrow. I thought that I should not smoke tomorrow and give it up today. I thought, however, that I would not be capable of not smoking. I mean, eventually I quit, but for different reasons. And this was 10 or 12 years ago. But I can also tell you why I don't start smoking again today. And that's the idea that a clock has ticked for 12 years. All these days I did not smoke. Now, the moment I will smoke again, the clock will jump back to zero. Right. That's interesting. You need strategies in order to learn the discipline of timing. That's also in the case of psychology. You might know the marshmallow example. Kids are being sent to a room um, full of marshmallows, and the children are told, just wait three minutes. I will be back in three minutes, and you will get a second marshmallow. And um, then the kids are being observed and most of the kids take a marshmallow and eat it nevertheless and the others who don't try to play a kind of hide and seek situation they hide under the table they close their eyes in order to overcome the time it takes until the educator is back in the room and kids who learn these strategies are more successful as adults. That's what we know. So in order to achieve a long-term goal, you have to refrain from doing things in your immediate um, future. Mrs. Flick says, well, I'm sorry, we have to stop here. And I have to say so consciously because I think we want to have a drink, something to uh, something to eat. I would like to thank the panel. I want to thank you, and I hope all of us enjoyed these discussions. Thank you very much, and hopefully see you soon.